Uh, hey everyone, thank you all for coming. Um, it feels weird to hear the word former. I was like, eh, the word former product manager. Um, but uh, I guess I'm now at a startup. I just joined uh, about a month or so ago. Uh, so I'm former Dropbox product manager. My name is Ketan, I'm a product manager. I've uh, been doing product for a while now, uh, about eight-ish years uh, around the Bay and, 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 and in other companies. Uh, and I've done a bunch of talks here, but I'm really excited to talk about prioritization as a PM. Uh, and uh, because it's, I think it's a topic that we all realize, at least as product managers or people getting into product, it's, a, it's, it's fairly important. It's, uh, it's something that I think we all know it's difficult and hard to do. Uh, so I decided, uh, let's just talk about it. Uh, oh yeah, so I'm uh, currently at this uh, company called Coalition. Uh, it is a cybersecurity and uh, cyber insurance startup. Uh, we are about 30 people now. I've, I've been there for a month. And uh, we're really trying to do a bunch of different things in the SMB space. Uh, but prior to that, uh, formerly, I was at Dropbox for a bunch of years, uh, worked on the ecosystem team there. So this was the team that uh, worked with partners, um, so strategic partners such as Google, Salesforce, uh, did some platform initiatives, and also uh, spent a bunch of time on the data infrastructure and the growth teams there. Um, and prior to Dropbox, I worked at another startup called as APT, uh, that was based out of the East Coast, uh, and uh, that was a company that did a lot of enterprise analytics. Uh, I'll, just, I'll share some stories from my experience there as well as from Dropbox today, uh, and then prior to that, I was uh, basically fooling around in my team. You know, if you were to tactically answer the question, what do I do in my day? Uh, or what do we do in our day? I think there's like a bunch of these things, right? Um, notifications. Uh, we enable sales and marketing to do their job by communicating product stuff. Uh, we figure out the elusive MVP. Uh, we analyze data and metrics. We align stakeholders. Uh, yada yada yada. So long list of things. Uh, I, I only could fit so many on the slide here. Um, but if you really peel the layers back. Um, Really what product management is about is, I would argue, is about prioritization. To make my talk seem more important. Um, so if you think about some of the things that I was talking about earlier, a lot of these things, especially at large companies, are done by other people. So if you're thinking about like analyzing data, there's a data analyst or a data scientist that does that for you. Uh, probably not at like you know in the 45 person startup um, that you probably have to analyze your own data. Uh, if you're talking to users, at really large companies, you have user researchers who talk to users. Uh, it was funny, when I first started at Dropbox, I, uh, I was waiting for the time when I talk to users, and they were like, no, 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 user research has everything ready for you. Uh, but so, inherently what happens is that you sort of peel back the layers of all the different tasks that a product manager is doing, and ultimately you realize that at the core uh, is really prioritizing. And what that means is when someone asks me, what does a product manager do? Uh, I typically say this. I say uh, a product manager's role is to build the right product for the right user at the right time. Uh, and uh, again, that's a very simple statement to say. Uh, there's a lot of nuances uh, associated within this. So, you know, the right product or the right feature, who's the right user? You may have multiple user personas. Um, you could have like a buyer or a seller, especially if you're building enterprise products. And the right time, meaning like what kind of milestones, what do you do for MVP and so on. Um, but really, that is sort of the core and the heart of what it means to be a PM. Um, so okay, prioritization. How do you do prioritization? Uh, the answer is straightforward, right? You build this matrix, the ROI matrix. You take the full list of your ideas. Uh, in this case, I think I pulled this one from a blog in Gusto. Uh, so let's say your two ideas are employee onboarding or federal tax setup. You say, OK, uh, what is my metric of success. In this case, I think it's customer success rate or whatever. And then you say, okay, what does it map to for each of my features? You say, uh, what is the engineering cost? And then you figure out what is the return on investment? And then you realize, ah, one of them has a 16.7% rate of return, and the other one has 11% rate of return, and you pick the 16.7% rate of return. Right? I think the product managers in the, in the room are going, well, what is he talking about? Like, what's going on here? Um, well, this is like a good helping function for prioritization, but rarely do PMs actually prioritize in this way. You never say like, okay, I will actually uh, figure out the exact ROI in like two decimal points and then figure out uh, which one's the winner. Uh, that's rarely the case. Prioritization is more of like an art and a science, and it's, it's, it's hard to do. 
Um, so what I figured I would do today is just share some of my own stories and lessons in prioritization. Uh, and I was telling someone here earlier, um, I might not tell you what to do, or I will tell you what not to do. Um, and so here are my five things to not do. Uh, and these are the five things that I will be talking about today. Um, so the first one is don't prioritize features. The second one is don't focus on customer wants. The third one is don't build an ROI matrix, that is the return on investment. Don't work on improving your product. And then uh, fifth and final one, don't prioritize what your boss tells you. Uh, so if you're looking at this, don't focus on customer wants, don't improve your product. What am I talking about? It doesn't make any sense, right? Um, but I'll promise you, I'm actually a PM. I, I'm not some phony guy impersonating like a PM. Um, so let's let's try to dive in and see what I'm really trying to say here. Um, so the first one is don't prioritize features. Um, I'm not really trying to say don't prioritize like product or like whatever. Um, so what I want to do is like share like an example with you all. Um, so the first um, example that I want to share with you here is from Dropbox. So uh, this was about a year and a half ago, and I was a, a PM on the ecosystem team, as I mentioned. Uh, and so one of my projects was building this thing called this Dropbox extensions. Um, so Dropbox extensions is sort of like Chrome extensions, wherein you install third-party applications on top of your Dropbox. And then you allow users to carry out a bunch of different actions uh, on top of their file. So here you have like sample resume, you can do a bunch of actions like sending stuff for signatures and uh, sending stuff to Gmail, uh, editing, sending facts, and so on and so forth. So my role as a product manager was to build, envision this platform, build out this platform, and you know make it successful. Um, and so yeah, so we, we built this platform over the course of about six months, and then uh, launched it in about November of 2018. Um, and what happened was our goal was to drive WCUs, uh, which was uh, stood for weekly collaborative uh, usage, uh, and it was sort of like a cousin of weekly active usage, if you, uh, if you want to think about it that way. And uh, we launched this feature, and the feature totally fell flat. No user used it, uh, or very few users used it, and the users who, who used it never came back. Um, and so very low usage and practically no retention uh, to speak of. And so um, my mandate was to grow WCUs, and um, you know, uh, when we saw this, and this is often the case with, many, uh, with much of product building, uh, we had no idea what to build. Uh, no clue what to build and what to prioritize. So if my engineers came and asked me, hey, what should we prioritize to grow our WCUs? I had no clue. Um, and so what this is, what the situation uh, is referred to in common parlance is uh, as the product, uh, as a feature product fit. Um, so our feature that we built, this, this whole platform, um, actually lacked feature product fit, uh, which meant that users weren't coming back, they weren't really uh, you know, using the product or finding it useful. And so uh, what we ended up doing was we, we pivoted to try and find this feature product fit. And so the goal was not to say, hey, there's feature A, there's feature B, there's feature C, which one should we do first and why? Uh, the question is, what are we trying to do here and how can we best do it? Uh, and so to find feature product fit, we went through this like iterative loop of talking to users, observing them, hypothesizing like what can work, because the users never told us uh, what they really wanted. Um, and then we ran a ton of experiments over the course of months, analyzed data with one objective. We just wanted to learn faster. We just wanted to see how we can learn faster and how we can get, uh, uh, get to this feature product fit. Um, and, 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 and in the end, we about five months of running experiments, that's exactly what happened. Like we were able to grow our usage to about 100,000 weekly collaborative users. And at any point in time, I just didn't know what my team was going to work on in the next sprint. I just knew that we were like listening to our users and figuring out on the fly what we wanted to do. Um, and so sort of the first takeaway for me, at least when running this project, was it's not just about the features, right? It's not about prioritizing A, B, C, D, and E. It's about how can you learn quickly? How can you figure out what makes sense for the user? And sometimes, especially when you launch, launch features, they don't work as well as you wanted, wanted to. And at that point in time, uh, what you really care about is learning. And what you really care about is, uh, is, is time. Um, this also reminds me of like a Mark Zuckerberg quote from like a while back. I was watching him um, in, a, in a talk and someone asked him, you know, what are the, how do you build like a successful startup? How do you, how do you, 
how do you, uh, you know, what are the mistakes that you want to avoid? And his response was super interesting. What he told was, you don't avoid mistakes. You just try to recover from them like really fast. Because you will make like a billion mistakes when you're building a startup. And I think that is similar to sort of like feature building or product building where no matter how much research you've done in the past, it's very hard to know what exactly will work and what exactly won't. And it's, uh, and it's important for you to, um, you know, optimize for learning and time versus, you know, I'll build feature one, then feature one, feature two. Um, so my second uh, uh, lesson is don't focus on customer wants. Uh, this is, has to be wrong. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I did have a question. Yeah. Uh, in the focusing on you know, learning from users, yeah. did you actually go out, well, how did you do that? Did you actually go out and interview users, or what was your methodology for learning from them? Yeah, so we did a bunch of, uh, uh, we did two specific uh, tasks. So one, we uh, ran a bunch of uh, surveys uh, mm -hmm. to figure out like, what exactly was going on. And then we did, a, we did two sets of in-person interviews. Um, so the first set was we identified three buckets of users. Uh, the first bucket was the users that came to our product and had repeat usage. The second bucket was the users who had used the product once and abandoned. And then the third bucket was the users who had never tried the product. Uh, so the questions that I wanted to know was for the users who are retaining, my question was why the heck are you retaining? Like why, why are you coming back? What's, what's so valuable for you? For the users who used it once and sort of dropped off, like what was not satisfying, why did you drop off? And for the users who, who abandoned it, which is like the large group, like what was missing? Like what would make this feature more attractive? Should we like call it out? Should we onboard you better? Things like that. Uh, but the second set of user interviews that we did was uh, once we had talked to the users and gathered data, we built some designs of running these analyses, we had this thing called Real World Wednesdays at Dropbox. Um, so what we would do is we would bring a bunch of users into our office um, and like have a, maybe a two-hour session where you know the users sit at like four or five tables, and then the PMs sort of rotate. Not just PMs, engineers, designers, everyone. We sort of rotate and like talk to a bunch of different users, and then you say like, "Hey, here's what we're building. Like, does this make sense?" And you sort of like have like a five-minute timer to like get real quick feedback on what users are think. That's sort of like what we try to do. Yeah. So the second one was don't focus on customer wants. Uh, this has to be wrong, right? Like. Kind of focus on customer wants. Uh, uh, all right, so let's, uh, let's uh, let me share another story here. Um, so this was uh, on another team at Dropbox. This was the analytics team uh, that I was leading. Um, and analytics at Dropbox is interesting. We build uh, Dropbox used to build all of their tools internally. Um, so this is when I say analytic tools, I mean like uh, data visualization, like dashboarding, like graphing, like querying, and all of that stuff. Uh, and so it's funny because all of these products were home built. Uh, this was a team of eight engineers that was PMing, and we were maintaining and building eight separate products. Uh, and you can imagine what happens here. Uh, it is basically a recipe for disaster, uh, really quickly. Uh, things were going out of hand where uh, basically an engineer had to support like eight different products if they were on call, uh, and uh, really we were not able to make much progress. Uh, and, and turns out all of these eight products had like a completely different user bases. So someone who was running A-B testing on the growth team didn't care about data pipelining. And the data pipelining team, like the data engineers, didn't care about visualization. So you had like these different groups of customers for whom their product was really, really important. Um, and it was very hard to sort of move away from it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and, and they had like a bunch of long lists of requests. And, and if you are a customer of this product, you you had a legitimate request, right? They were actually using this for their workflows. Uh, but from our side, the team was literally dying trying to support these things. Um, and so what we had to do at that point is our customers, thousands of them, had like a billion watts. Uh, but I had to focus on the team's needs. Um, so what, I, what the point I'm trying to make here is, you know, there's often this notion of like, hey, focus on the customer, focus on the customer. But what I realized as a PM is there is like a good and valid reason to not focus on the customer and focus on your team at times. Uh, because if your team burns out, uh, you don't have a team and your customers don't matter, your product doesn't matter, your company doesn't matter. Um, and so for that reason, uh, it was very interesting where we completely shifted, pivoted from focusing on any of our customer wants or needs, and then we said, guess what? The team is more important. Let's focus on what the team needs. And what the team needed was a significant reduction 
in the number of products that we are managing. Um, and so what we did was uh, we uh, basically cut bait and we said like, hey, we have eight products. This makes no absolutely no sense. Let's just work on one and we'll support the two others that absolutely need to be supported. And then the other ones, we're just like, nope, not going to support it. So if you send me an email, you'll receive an automated response. No, nope, not supported. Which is very tough to do, but it is important um, for you as a product manager, at least for me, it has been important to think of my team as like this other stakeholder that I have to like, you know, challenge and nourish and keep in the back of my mind. Typically, if you have a strong engineering manager, they help you support and, and, and do this. Uh, but, you know, you can't simply say I have two user personas when prioritization. You have this third user persona, like the N plus one persona, that is the engineers or, or whoever else on your team that you have to prioritize. Um, there was another example um, where we, uh, where me and my EM struck a deal to spend 30% of our sprint um, to basically just focus on tech tech. Right? Often people ask me like, how do you prioritize tech tech? Like, how does that how does that work? Do you do you totally like do you, do you totally like uh, you know push that further down the line? And it's easy to do, right? Because it's easy to say like, hey, our customer, especially if you're like a small startup and there's like you know a bunch of like few customers banging on your door for like a bunch of features, it's easy to say like, no, 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 let's push the tech tech down the road. Uh, but you cannot really like, you know, push that so far ahead that it comes to you, uh, it comes back to bite you in the ass. Um, and so typically what I've tried to do on my teams when I've prioritized tech tech is I've tried to talk to the engineers and maybe the tech lead and figure out like what is an appropriate balance of like working on customer facing features and working on tech tech. And for me, typically that has like landed around like 30 to 40% of the time. Um, and typically the way we've tried to do this is not more than a quarter um, of, of doing so. Uh, but this was a case where I had to just say like, hey, keep customer needs aside or at least deprioritize them and prioritize like uh, a tech tech um, because that's more important. Um, the other reason why I had to prioritize, yes? How do you keep your teams from going on these side chains, these side plans too? Keep on improving things that don't need to be improved in the work value. Uh, sorry, I didn't fully get your question, but are you asking me how do you keep on? How do you keep the engineers from going too deep into things that don't need to be optimized that don't have impact? Ah, correct. Yeah, so I think typically what I do in that case is yeah, so like engineers like you know like I will hyper optimize this code to be like this amazing thing that can compile in point one seconds instead of one second. Uh, so the way I try to avoid that is by typically relying a lot on my EM. Um, or my tech lead. So typically what happens is the tech lead or the engineering manager um, has a lot of context on the product needs and the customer needs, and you can prep them for that. What you can do is get your tech lead into customer conversations, especially if you have sales meetings, get them into those conversations, just in like a sit and like hear this out, so that they know how important it is uh, for you to prioritize the other 70% and why that matters. And then when um, you are talking to your tech lead about prioritizing the tech tech part of it, you can say, hey, you know, this other piece that we talked about, it's super important for that um, for that customer. Hence, we might not we might not have you know like infinite time to optimize our code. So let's let's try to figure out uh, how can we time about it and we spend a quarter on it, something like that. Did that make sense? Uh, any other questions? Yes. So in, in your example of consolidating eight products to two, yeah. it sounds like that was the internal tools team, right? Yep. So you consolidate eight internal tools into two. So a decision like that is really easy, right? Because it's purely internal, right? How do you think the situation, uh, how, how would you have acted differently if it was actually like customer facing, you had six nines of SLAs, right? That level of Dropbox, yeah. like user facing. Yeah, how yeah, do you yeah. think that decision would have changed? Obviously you yeah, never yeah, have I, eight customer facing products, but. For sure, right? And. Um, uh, I was about to say this decision was was not that easy, but it was certainly I would agree that it was easy because it's internal. Cheaper, tools. cheaper decision. It's it's, yeah. it's cheaper to do. Um, I think the uh, the if you are like an ICPM, the easiest way to do or the, the the first thing that you have to do is sort of communicate upwards, right, on why this matters and what are the real consequences that are happening. Um, and uh, typically, so I I tell I tell how I did it in the internal scenario, and then maybe there is like analogies to how I would do it in like an external scenario. The way I did this is I basically escalated all the way up to our C-level, like brought the head of product, our CEO, or CTO, and I basically said like, I guess my laptop's going to down. I basically said that like, hey, uh, this team's going to die if if we don't if we don't cut bait. This team is going to die. Like, do you want like no analytics 
or like some analytics. So that was the option, right? Uh, and again, like, you know, building, especially if you're in a startup and you're like really stuck, you, you know, it's, it's a tough life, right? You're, you're stretching yourself constantly. And at least now from Dropbox to the startup, I, I can feel it and I can sense it. Um, but I think if your team is at absolute risk, Right or like you know your engineers are burning out. I think you know you you, you got to bring it up to the CEO. And yeah, then, it didn't sound like you had headcount either, right? For that. Yeah, we had no headcount. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So, uh, so in that case, you just have to and and, and at that point, like you know, <clears throat> it is the exact decision to say like, guess what? Like, you know, do I have the team or do I have like you know five customers? Because yeah. if, if the team leaves, uh, then it makes very little sense. Um, sweet. Oh, so this one um, was another example. Um, which is sort of like a counter example to my like first story. So we were building these uh, these extensions and running a ton of experiments, right? Uh, we had a bunch of junior engineers on the team uh, who were actually up for promotion. And they were like, oh my god, like I'm just running experiments and I'm like, uh, will I get promoted if I am like just like working on experiments? I can't like, you know, I can't like showcase my technical capabilities. Uh, and so I had to play this whole like balancing act with the EM on my team being like, okay, like, the engineer, and, and, and at a big company, engineers can quickly move teams. Um, but as a small company, they may just like leave. Um, so uh, it was very interesting for me where I had this super interesting conversation with my EM. And we talked about like, okay, what are the upcoming projects that might be interesting for these sets of engineers? And how can we perhaps like move one or two of those projects to keep those engineers engaged and like actually excited about like the things that are coming down the pipe? Um, and that was like, you know, it was unlike another conversation that I've had where you will not like sort of think of prioritizing something to, to help an engineer get promoted or keep an engineer excited. But it's also sort of like filling into this like bucket of like, you can't simply just say customer, customer, customer. You have to think of your team. And that's sort of like the broader point I'm trying to make. Uh, so yeah, so, so I guess like my second, um, second takeaway is uh, I specifically used customer wants and not, I didn't say customer needs because customer needs are important. Are very important, uh, but sometimes customer wants can be this long list of things that you may actually uh, not have to do. Uh, but teams' needs are something that you absolutely have to care about, uh, and so that becomes like really important. Um, cool. Uh, so the third one is don't build a oh, yes. Sorry, yes, a quick question. Yeah, uh, please. It's an interesting case about the internal tools. Yeah. Um, so while I understand that the engineers are obviously happy when you get that because they have less things to worry about, yeah. how did you ensure that the internal teams are still okay after you reduce the tools to like two instead of eight? Yeah, uh, one could say I didn't make a lot of friends by doing that. And it's hard, right? Like, huh. you know, so someone's like doing visualization for like ever. Uh, it's hard because, you, you know, you basically avoid seeing them. Like if you see them at lunch, you should like walk away. Um, that's one strategy. The second strategy is basically uh, what we did was we we um, and I'll talk, I'll cover this a little bit further down the line. We tried to support them as much as possible with very little involvement from our side. Uh, we tried to build a lot of documentation and like, made it almost self serve. And then we put all these these other six products in what is called as live support, which basically means uh, we will not respond to any of your requests. Uh, we have documentation; you can read it, uh, and the product is still usable. Right, and if the product dies, we will, you know, resurrect it. We'll like put some, we'll put some effort to like bring it back up. Um, so we didn't like totally kill it. We kept them alive, but we annoyed them a lot. Um, and you know, like uh, people deal with it. It's okay. Um, so um, yeah, were your so did you for the engineers who didn't lock out and whose products you know you you pan. Were for they, the engineers, yeah, yeah, were yeah. they repurposed? Like, were they assigned to new projects, or how did that work? Yeah, so um, that's actually a very nuanced point. Um, so uh, you can obviously imagine that of the eight products, there are eight engineers, and an engineer will have a pet product, right? And so now you're like saying, like, ah, your pet product is dead. Like, work on this other stuff that, like, you know, someone else's baby, you know, you know ditch your baby, pick up someone else's baby. Um, now that I put it that way, like that seems way worse, but I wouldn't tell it that way to the engineer. Um, I think the goal was like, hey, like, you know, um, uh, again, like in some of these cases, I rely a lot on my engineering lead and engineering manager because they've spent many hours on one on ones and built relationships with them. Um, and they have their careers, uh, you know, they have their career interests at heart and stuff like that. So it's a lot of like uh, messaging this is like very much reliant on leveraging the EM. I had like a, an amazing EM named Chris on this project. And me and Chris, we would like sit down and 
you know, we would say like, hey, here's sort of like what we are cutting down and here's why it makes sense. Here's why it makes sense from the mission of the team and so on. Uh, so it's like a slightly careful messaging. And, and again, like the way we messaged this was, and this was also our true intention, the, the true intention was not to ditch them forever. The true intention was to sort of get back, to sort of putting them on pause for the sake of the team so that we could rehire and grow the team over the slightly longer term. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's maybe the strategy. Mm -hmm. um, don't tell your engineer, I'll keep your baby. Uh, again, things start to do, right? Um, cool, so don't build an ROI matrix. I think like, um, I, I mean, I've, in many years of PMing, I've built like these sort of matrices that I pointed out, but never have I actually said like, you know, this is like the, 11.1% uh, efficiency, that is 12.2% efficiency, uh, for many reasons, right? One, uh, these are all like guesswork, like you've no clue, like okay, this is gonna give me like, uh, you know, growth of 100K uh, users, and that one's gonna give me like 200K users. It's all like guesswork, and number of engineers, like the engineer's gonna go say like, ah, that might take like a month, ah, that might take like, you know, scratch their chin and say, ah, oh, that might take two weeks. Um, so first of all, it's guesswork. Number two, um, many features have like, entirely different metrics that they move, no matter how hard you try. Um, so uh, at my startup, I was just thinking like, you know, set of projects that improve our like bottom line revenue, set of projects that improve sort of overall product usability and experience, set of projects that help onboarding and new users. Um, so, and when you have like these different metrics that like each feature is moving, it's very hard for you to, um, for you to say like, oh, I'll compare apples and oranges and declare like the apple the, the winner. Um, uh, but, the other point that I wanted to make um, is, uh, is is at times, um, you know, uh, as I, I really like this comic strip, uh, and at times, the reason you don't read an ROI matrix is like some things are like plain obvious on what to do. Um, and they may not be like obvious in front of you, uh, and you may like say do this like a ton of analysis to say like, okay, I will, I will do X, I will do, I will do, I will do Y, I will do Z. Uh, but really, you always knew you had to do A, and you're just doing this like random exercise to just like prioritize for the sake of prioritization, or to say, to, to really please someone that you're like you know doing this effort. Um, and and the reason I like this chart is because I think there is some truth to this, where you know you, there is probably like a fire burning, but you're trying to say like oh I'll optimize this, and so the equivalent of this on my analytics team was like the team is dying, but I'm thinking like oh should this button be blue or should this button be red? <laughs> uh, it doesn't make any sense, right? Um, and the reason I say this, and the reason I say this example, is because I myself have been guilty of doing this many times. Uh, so I want to share one number, 250 million. Um, and so the story of this is, um, uh, again, on the ecosystem team, this was when I first joined the team. Um, I like, you know, was part of this like, huge meeting, like, you know, head of our business development, like, uh, you know, head of director of engineering, a bunch of people, like, we sat through and said, like, oh, we'll figure out the roadmap as a group. And we like spent like hours like you know oh like let's move this let's move that, uh, but coming out of that meeting I was like was this even worth it? Uh, because we were trying to build like different integrations with Dropbox, and uh, you know this one number 250 million uh, or more than 250 million is the number of users that overlap between Gmail and Dropbox, right? And so that is such a huge number that it hails everything else in comparison. It doesn't like nothing else like stands in comparison. Uh, and so we spent like four or five hours trying to figure out the perfect roadmap, but in reality, we could have just gone to work on working on that one obvious thing. And and often, and I bring this up because I've often found in, in situations where like, you know, there's this prioritization exercise ahead of you. Uh, and typically what I try to do is I prioritize only three months in advance, ahead. Um, you can build a, a yearly sort of like vision, uh, but your actual tactical roadmap, probably three months after that, it changes really quickly, especially in fast moving things. Um, and so for us, we spent like perfectly like, you know, figuring out what to do for the next year, but we already knew what we were going to do for three months. And like, guess what? After the three months, the stuff that we were doing all changed, right? Like it was, it was meaningless. And so if you are prioritizing like 200 features and saying like, guess what? Like I'll perfectly prioritize the 200 feature. By the time you build the second or the third feature, the rest of your prioritization, I promise you will change. Um, so it makes no sense to spend a lot of time meaninglessly. And so I think my takeaway here was, uh, at least in this case, if there's a fire, instead of saying this is fine, like you know, you, priority number one is put out the fire, and the rest of the stuff will follow. Um, 
But this is repeated many times in my experience. So uh, at the company I was before Dropbox, um, this was uh, Flight Predator Technologies, it was, it was an enterprise analytics company. We built this super complicated analytics product, right? Uh, and a lot of, and you would put like 50 engineers on this product. And like all the engineers would like, you know, focus on tweaking and building this crazy complicated machine. Um, but turned out that what our users really loved was this one data visualization tool that one engineer built over the course of a week. Like that's the one thing that our users absolutely loved. Uh, the reason was most of our users were marketing analysts uh, and uh, at like these retail startups such as retail companies like Walmart, Target and so on. In those companies, the data is totally isolated. The IT department like, hangs on to their data and like, doesn't give it to anyone. And so the marketing analysts, for them, the freedom was not this like, crazy complicated like, you know, uh, machine that did complicated analysis. It was just like super simple like data visualization. Right? Like, I just want to see how much sales I had in the past four months. Um, and it was not obvious to us because we were just like saying, like, oh, this has so much revenue. Um, you know, we are selling these contracts. We have all these like you know, sales engineers like doing all this, it seemed more important. Uh, but you look, you talk to users and you, you know, you, you looked at the data, like every user was coming to this tool every single day. And yet we had one engineer who had worked on this and was not prioritized. Um, so, so, so the way I try to phrase this to myself is we saw the light in our users seeing the data. Uh, and, and so we prioritized this, um, this small tool. We put like a bunch of engineers on it. We solved, we solved this for our users and our product became dramatically more successful. Um, and so, so the notion here is, it was sort of obvious what we had to work on. It was not so obvious, like, like it was sort of on the side. Uh, but once we figured it out, uh, and it was not like the main big product that we were focusing on. Um, so my recommendation here is, you know, it's easy to sort of get into the weeds of prioritizing like multiple features of a product, uh, but your users may totally be finding value in like this weird way or this weird side thing that you've not looked. Um, and I think like Gmail is also an interesting case for Google, but Google built Gmail in like you know 20 percent time and and randomly became this like crazy successful thing, and now it's like you know powering all of their enterprise efforts. Um, so my um, so my so my third uh, takeaway I guess is uh, at times prioritization really is obvious, and you don't have to spend a, like a lot of time on it, especially you know that your prioritization is going to change down the down the road. Uh, so if someone says they like, give me a perfect roadmap for a year, I'd be like, no, I, I don't think it makes any sense. What should we work on for the next three months? Or what should we work on for the next, you know, one and a half months, especially if you're asking away? We'll figure that out, and then, you know, your roadmap evolves. Um, and at other times, like this ROI matrix, like, is basically a science and an art. You have to figure out the like, team dynamics, you have to figure out, like, uh, and if you're at large companies, you're dependent on other teams, so really you're not really making independent decisions at all. Um, so I like to think of it as like sometimes it's obvious, uh, and at, at other times it's an art. Um, in some ways, like the, the hey prioritization is obvious makes you seem like wait is that that easy? Um, it's not. But I think the point that I'm also trying to subtly convey is prioritization is hard because you try to prioritize over like a really long time frame. Um, try to cut down that time frame, and it sort of like makes things very clear what needs to happen like ASAP. Um, um, cool. So number four, don't work on improving the product. Uh, I guess you're you're a smart crew by now. You figured out that I'm just sort of using these as like uh, hooking points to just make things interesting. Um, so I don't really mean don't work on improving your product. Improve your product, make it better for your users. Uh, but don't work on improving the product alone. Uh, is what I try to uh, what I try to say. Um, and so and so coming back to his question earlier on, like you know, how do we manage this sort of cutting down different products? Uh, and, 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 and balancing expectations with our users, uh, here's what we did. Um, so the really painful part, parts of why engineers were suffering um, was because we had this one Slack channel uh, that the on-call engineer would man, and then everyone would just ping the Slack channel, hey, I have this question, like respond to this. Uh, hey, I have this bug, like can you fix this? And so imagine if we are an engineer, I don't know who are former engineers, I'm not. So bless, uh, bless those of you who are engineers. Imagine you're an on-call engineer and you have to deal with eight separate code bases and eight separate products. You would like tear your hair up, right? Like it's crazy. Um, and so the question was, what can we do to, um, to, to address this? And what we did in this case was we had a documentation sprint. We just said, okay, no, no code writing. We all sit for, a, for two weeks and just write documentation. Come in the hall. It's like, it's like the worst job in the world, right? So what do you do is, uh, here's my trick. Uh, what we did was we built a team playlist. 
uh, and we said like we contribute songs, and we all like built like a team playlist. Everyone has headphones on, and we play like, great documentation. Mm -hmm. And then you make fun of the guy who like listens to top forty. Um, <laughs> but basically, try to you know make make have team have like a fun atmosphere. But you have, you have to do it right. You just figure out the documentation and like wrote like a ton of documentation. Um, and then um, we didn't want to like respond. Slack is especially I don't know who likes Slack. I don't like Slack at all. It's like super annoying. Like you're doing work and it annoys you. So we totally pivoted to a different user model, like a customer support model. We said actually uh, we will install Zendesk, and then anyone who has to, you know, at least even internally, uh, even though we are your friends, you have to submit a ticket. And that way, uh, when you know we had to cut support, we would just like respond and meet back in an automated fashion. We would say like, sorry, your product is not supported. Uh, go find help yourself. Uh, <laughs> again, that was not. I'm just paraphrasing. <laughs> um, it was much nicer in my words. Um, so, uh, so, so the bottom line I'm trying to say is, uh, it's not just about improving your product, right? Like, it's not about saying like, oh, I'll improve my flow, or I will like cut down the number of steps, I'll make this faster. It's about like uh, prioritizing the process around your product, right? Uh, documentation is a form of like, it's not technically a product, but it is sort of contributes to your product experience, uh, especially if you are like you know enterprise product working on APIs. API documentation, classic example of what you can give. Um, customer support, not necessarily product, but really good products have great product experiences. And so my uh, my <coughs> takeaway or the point that I'm getting to is uh, prioritization is again not feature A, feature B, feature C. It is about like prioritizing like processes around your product. Uh, and so try to think of like what kind of processes uh, around the boundaries of your product exist and see if you would need to prioritize them. And sometimes like Prioritizing them means like not writing a single line of code, and that's fine, right? Because your ultimate objective is not like generating work for engineers. Uh, your your objective is not to write specifications. Your objective is to make the product successful. And for some of them, you don't. You just need to like buy like a Zendesk license, uh, and your toughest part is getting the corporate card, uh, and not like you know, figuring out the technical details. Um, and I have another example from like that team as well. Um, when we when when we sort of stabilized things um, and got like things working on this analytics team, uh, people were still not using the, the the tools that we were improved on. You know, imagine the frustration, right? Like we went like, oh, eight products suck. Like let's cut six, five of them. Let's get to three, and then we improve these three products, and nobody's using them. Like, what is wrong here? Um, and so it turned out that uh, the reason people weren't using the the tools themselves was because the underlying data was bad, uh, or the underlying data was untrustworthy. Uh, so it was this situation of like garbage in, garbage out. And again, I was prioritizing all of these, like, okay, we have one product now, how can we make that like nicer, list, list all the use cases. But there was this totally like data was sort of central to our, it was the, the, the data flowing through the system was central uh, to, our, uh, to our product success. Uh, and so I had to go in and prioritize uh, fixing our data quality problems. And that meant like totally random challenges, right? Like figuring figuring out like hiring a data engineering team, uh, trying to clean up our data, like labeling tables as like golden tables that are reliable, uh, and, and doing all these like sort of cleanup activities. Again, no end work done, but like you're trying to say like, hey, how can I like prioritize the success of my product? And it's not about building features; it's actually about building process or building like structures around the product. And in this case, it was like. You know, we hired like a head of data uh, at Dropbox um, because this was this was an issue. And again, uh, I spent a lot of time planning for our data quality strategy, like what our what our data quality should be. Not my job, but I had to do it because otherwise the product wouldn't succeed. Um, so uh, at least like I come from the sort of school of thought that like the PM's job is to pick up where things are slacking. Um, How do you realize that the, the problem was in data? Do you have constant complaints from the users? Oh, uh, that was actually, uh, I should have explained this comic strip. Uh, so the reason why people didn't trust the data was because they would like analyze the data uh, and they would present the charts uh, and uh, people would ask like, hey, why is that off? Or this is inconsistent with, so the senior execs would look at sales and say, wait, your sales number is 1.1 million? That person's sales was like 1.05 million. Where's the delta? You guys go figure it out. And like, you know, like if the COO says like, wait, the number is 1.05 and the number is 1.1, you go like, what the heck? Right? And so you go try to figure out, and somewhere, somewhere you dig deeper, and some engineer has written some log slightly differently, which means it's tagged differently, it's rolled up slightly differently, which means that this, you know, a small change in the code, like this chaos effect, like becomes this huge, like $500,000 difference in your revenue numbers in two separate tables. 
So that was like the underlying reason. It was like the worst thing to fix. Um, and so people were like, I don't want to present to the COO a number that he's going to question and I have to spend three weeks chasing down. Uh, so no, I'm just going to like write my own queries and like figure stuff out by myself. Yeah. So that was a good reason. Uh, so yes, uh, execs pointing out like issues in the data. Probably skip the XKCD comment here. Uh, cool. So I think like my takeaway here is like don't just figure out the issues in your product, but also figure out like issues in your process. Because um, you might be spending a lot of time like improving your product, but like it's still not successful because you're just not paying attention to the to the process behind it and the sort of boundaries uh, across it. Um, my recommendation. So my some of you may ask me like how do you think of like the process around your product? Uh, I just uh, shadow users. Um, if you can't do this in person, um, what I typically tell our users is, hey, imagine that I'm not here, just do your job. Right? Uh, I'll sign whatever NDA you want, um, just, just do your job. And at my, uh, at my company, at my startup, uh, we actually work with brokers, um, insurance brokers, basically. Uh, and these guys have no clue what like, tech does and like, how things work. Uh, so I just said, like, hey, this is Google Hangouts. Uh, you click this button, like, I will show up on the screen, minimize me, uh, share your screen, and I will sign whatever NDA, just do your job. And like, uh, and I will listen to you. Uh, and so I just like kept listening and kept taking screenshots, just figuring out like, hey, what other products are they using along with me? Um, and that's so much more revealing than you bringing them in, showing your product, and asking them what, what are you doing, like how, how do you use this? Because in isolation, they would say yes, I probably would click that button. But then like, uh, one of the interesting things that I saw was uh, our product changes UI when the window is minimized. Or like, you know, they, you start like full screen. So we built this like pretty web app with like all the buttons in like the in like a very you know, wide fashion. And when the once the window was minimized, there was like a horizontal scroll bar, and the and this user totally missed it. And they were like, ah, I don't, I can't see it. Okay, and they sent an email to us. And so it was like super interesting to see like, oh, they're juggling one more window, so you, you you don't know what's going on. So for process, I guess like long story short, process just happened. Um, okay, can I just yes. clarify? So you're saying yeah. that you were working with the brokers? Yes. And they and you were watching what they were doing because they were sharing your screen. Their they were screen. sharing their screen. So you were like they were just in time using your product, and you were watching what they were doing. Exactly. So that's a form of user interview, I guess. Yeah, I was not interviewing them. You were I, not. You were no, just watching. I was just watching, and I was just oh. listening to them. Interesting. Yep. So if you if you were to view like the communication between you and the user as you creating the features, uh, as what? So if you view a communication channel between you, between product and the user, yeah. product communicates creating features, you get the communication back to them by doing, by shadowing them. How does that scale? Because you can get stuck into this thing where you find a few of those core users, those early adopters who want a particular product, but it might not be the product that you think the market needs, the wider market needs. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I think like, yeah, so, um, uh, absolutely, it doesn't scale. We never intended to. This is a, we're still fighting for our market fit, so it makes a lot of sense for us to do it. I think the what we try to do at larger companies think makes uh, makes for better like scaled approaches. So some of the scaled approaches that we did were uh, one is sampling, right? Like you sample like you know ten people and try to do that. Uh, number two is you try to do user testing dot com. So at larger companies at, at scale, you have slightly more budget, so you just pay user testing dot com and. You get slightly lower quality feedback, but you get like larger quantity feedback. Um, and then um, slowly you move to the survey part of the world, where again you can easily get like larger quantity feedback. You can get lower quality feedback. Um, we also instituted this thing called full story, where you can actually like replay like what people click mm -hmm. through in the product. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Super cool tool. Um, and so you can actually like play video replays of people clicking through your tool. And so you can just like try to uh, match those videos of user screens being recorded to like their personas. And then you can say like, ah, like, you know, uh, someone who's a free user, someone who's like a professional user, someone who's a plus user, someone who's a team user, someone who's an admin, and try to sample it. Um, so typically, uh, I do agree with you that like as you scale, uh, it's harder to have this super personal relationship and like build products for one person, or, like, you know, get feedback from one person. Um, but you have like more, um, you have more money or like more more resources to do more things. Um, and then uh, data becomes super critical. Uh, at Dropbox scale, we were, we were able to run like a ton of experiments. Um, 
at like a small startup, you may have like five customers. You talk to all five. If you have 50 customers, you can talk to 10. Uh, but if you have like 50,000 customers, you can start running data. Uh, so that's the spectrum that I guess I'm trying to choose. Um, um, cool. So number five, uh, don't prioritize what your boss says. So this is like the easiest one, right? Like who wants to listen to a boss? Nobody. Now I think what I mean here is um, when I was a junior PM, I don't know how many junior, junior PMs exist uh, I mean, uh, here in the audience, but it was very easy for me to, you know, use the boss's opinion as like a short framework for prioritization. Uh, it was very easy for me to go and say like, ah, oh, like the boss's top point is this. Let me just work on this. It'll make me look good, and it sort of works. And if like you know things don't work, I can basically say, ah, oh, yes, the boss you told me, right? Like I work, I work on this. Um, but like as you sort of grow in your careers, I think that's a very bad template to follow because it sort of puts you in this position where um, you don't necessarily think, um, uh, you know, think of like you know product challenges on your own. And there's value in it. And the reason I say that is because. You know, your boss is coming from like a higher level, right? Your boss is like more strategic vision. Your boss is more like um, you know directional like information, like what is the company doing? Um, they have like more information on how your product or team operates with other departments or teams. The, the perspective that you have is more on the ground. You have like data from like your users. You have data from like uh, I don't know user research, talking to users, and so on. And so, uh, and so there are these very different and valuable perspectives. And the reason I'm sharing this information is with, with my first one year of being a PM, I like, looking back at least, I leaned very heavily on like, oh, like my boss is telling this, like, let's do that. And then the product didn't work, and we were like, oh, what's going on? It's clearly obvious that we didn't work on the right set of things. Um, so um, story number one here is uh, from Dropbox. So uh, one of the teams that I was on, uh, this was like around Dropbox. Like, and like, you know, Dropbox was trying to find newer ways to grow and uh, grow our business. Uh, and so we wanted to monetize our platform, right? Like we wanted to say, like, let's make money. Uh, and uh, especially, you know, we, we have to show quarter to quarter growth. Um, and so senior leadership basically wanted to wanted us to grow our business. Um, they wanted to either charge our users who used our apps to pay for the apps, or they wanted to charge partners who are building apps on top of the platform to say, like, hey, pay for the platform. Uh, but uh, and it was and, and I was under a lot of pressure to say like let's monetize and let's like do monetization. Uh, but having talked to users as well as partners, it was very obvious to me that that was not an option at all. Uh, it was very clear to me that like hey, this is not possible because users clearly told us we do not have enough value from these apps to pay you guys. And then the partners were like we're not getting enough traffic from this to pay you. It doesn't make any sense for us to pay you. Um, and so. Uh, you know, how do you how do you sort of broach this topic, right? Like your boss is asking you something and then you're going and saying no. Um, I think there are two ways I used here. One was I went and said showed a lot of like raw data on like, hey, do I find this feature compelling enough to pay for it? Like no. Uh, or you know, recorded user videos where people said that like they didn't want to pay. The second thing is uh, I did, you know, sort of find a midway where I said like, hey, uh, you know, we, we cannot promise a monetization. Um, goal or target for this year, but we can promise to run some experiments, right? Like we can promise to see, like, hey, if we have like a, you know, uh, if we add like a paid apps button, will people click on it? Um, you know, are people even willing to sort of open up their wallets and pay us money? Uh, and so, so, sort of the goal here was, uh, you know, at times your <coughs> your boss or senior leadership may be asking like unreasonable things or things that are obviously not uh, great for you to work on. Uh, or seemingly impossible to achieve. Uh, at that point, like I think it's very important to sort of push back, and, and for that reason, it's good, especially if you're early stage PM, to like build that muscle of sort of pushing back uh, against uh, against what you might be asked to do. Um, and if you're always trying to in this mode of things, saying yes, uh, we'll try to do it, then you may end up in this position where you may not be able to achieve your goals. Um, uh, second example, again, super quick was. Uh, uh, when Dropbox signed a deal with uh, Salesforce, uh, this was like a pretty big deal and a pretty large partnership with Dropbox, and I was sort of the lead PM on it. Um, we sort of jointly promised that we would deliver this product called Digital Asset Engagement. Uh, so the CEO and the CEO signed shake hands and said we would introduce this new product called Digital Asset Engagement. So it's not really like clear what this really was. Uh, it was this new product or this concept that we, we had to build. Uh, it was sort of related to digital asset management, if you know, if you, if you know what that means. It's basically sort of like, um, managing images and uh, you know uh, keeping a, a more managed repository for images, if you, if you can call, if you can call that. 
And so what I did was I actually went and you know did a bunch of sort of on the ground user research, went to like the Salesforce large conference that like plugs up the traffic and stuff. Um, and, and basically talking to users made it obvious that they didn't really need this like crazy digital asset engagement thing. Really what they wanted was like a simple integration between Dropbox and uh, Salesforce's like marketing cloud for sort of creative assets to be stored within Dropbox and being accessed within um, uh, being accessed within um, marketing cloud. Um, and so once we knew that, we had sort of that data to prove that like, hey, this is what users want. Um, and what we proposed was we said like this integration is sort of phase one of like this larger effort that was sort of undefined. Um, and then uh, we said that, hey, guess what? Like we'll build the simple integration, we'll run some pilots, we'll see success. And then uh, we'll sort of like then go to this larger strategy because this is what makes sense for the user. Uh, and so since this was totally not defined, we basically defined this as this. Um, and then um, built this super simple integration and ran some pilots. We got some adoption. And then we were able to sort of change the narrative a little bit to say like, hey, actually, this is where the opportunity lies and we'll push that around. Um, and so instead, if we had tried to say like, hey, this is what we promised the world, we'll try to build this, it would have been much harder. Uh, versus you know being able to push back was was very critical there, um, and so um, I guess my final takeaway uh, is uh, you know prioritization, especially when it's uh, you know vis a vis so the people that you report to is almost always like a push pull, like they will push a bunch of things on you, or you're trying to pull them in certain directions. Um, it's super important to um, you know figure out like a good balance of like top down versus bottom up. Um, how you would balance that is up to you, but I think like it's important to keep that in mind. I think like there are always challenges to doing so, and it's always not easy to say like, especially if you're at a startup saying like no CEO, like you will not do this. Um, so I think it's it's important, but uh, I think establishing that sort of like right mindset of like why is it like not promising everything and like not committing to everything, things like that, the softer aspects of your interaction matter a lot because ultimately they will affect the downstream prioritization and it will, it will affect the downstream. Um, sort of success of your product. Um, and so my my five takeaways, I guess, is uh, what not to do is uh, don't just prioritize on features, uh, but prioritize learning and time. Um, don't just prioritize on customer wants, but think of the team's needs. Um, don't just build this ROI matrix. Uh, and, and quick note on this ROI matrix, right? Um, uh, I'm sure all of us have heard this cracking the PM interview, um, and everyone reads this cracking the PM interview, and there's this like, uh, they have this interview template where, like, you know, they have this. Oh, right, let's prioritize with the prioritization matrix. Um, it was interesting because, you know, like I myself have used this in the past and I've done this prioritization matrix. Uh, but at Dropbox, I, it came off of like an interview review where the person was like declined and it was basically said like they used a cracking the PM interview framework out of the book, right? Uh, and so if you robotically use this ROI matrix, even in an interview, it doesn't get you through. So imagine what happens in reality. So. Um, so not just an ROI matrix, but work on the obvious. Um, and again, this whole notion of like, uh, don't plan for too long, but just try to figure out what's nearby. Um, not just improving the product, but process as well. Like think of the process boundaries around your product. Uh, and then finally, sort of not just bosses wishes, but being opportunistic. So uh, when I say opportunistic, it is the opportunities that you're recognizing um, um, while having sort of that bottom sub data and try to influence um, your your stakeholders in the right way with, with the information that you have. Um, so yeah, so that was uh, that was my I guess five lessons um, from uh, some of the five lessons. I'm I'm sure um, all of us have many other lessons, but uh, yeah, I wanted to open it up for questions. Um, yes. Yeah, I do have a question. Um, when you put this picture of the fire and stuff, there's something you need to price 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 for the obvious things. Yeah. Um, at least on my theory, it feels like it's always like like turning down like fires. Yeah. And sometimes I feel like it was hard to get like innovation or proof like something else. Like, um, is, is it is basically look it's like if it's a small company or it's different and big company? How is your theory? Like, how do you keep the balance between like? like Things are always on fire. How do you like? Are you just like a firefighter or are you like a product builder? Is that is that like the right question? Yeah. Like, like how you, <laughs> so like how, how much of the fire you need to like turn down you know, doing things better as well, you know? Yeah. You know it is happening sometimes. Yeah, so I think um, I, I, I didn't see too much at Dropbox, but I've seen at the two startups that I've been at. Um, and I think like the, uh, the question that I start asking is, is this normal, right? Like uh, at a super early stage company, 
uh, having a bunch of fires in your product just like falling down is like makes sense, right? Because if the baby is like falling down, you gotta like pick it back up. And so obviously, you know, reliability is like weaker, and, like testing is bad, you try to like make this thing walk and run, right? Um, but fundamentally, I try to question, sort of go back and question like uh, practices and processes, right? I ask like, oh, are we writing enough unit tests? Are we writing good enough integration tests, right? Is the testing framework good? Um, uh, are our code practices good? Is our like is infrastructure reliable? Like, try to identify where the fire, you know, you're trying to put out the fire, or where is the fire coming from? It's sort of like diagnosing the symptoms um, of the issues um, and trying to do that with maybe the your tech lead or the head of engineering and asking them like, hey, you know, like, is this like error rate normal? Like, are we, is some amount of errors is normal, but um, can we like, what is the root cause of this? And so trying to identify the root cause is probably like really important. That's, that's how I would do it. Um, Yes. So a lot of these, like all these different areas to me have like a ton of depth. Yeah. Right? Like each one of these subject areas is, yeah. you know. We can talk about it for hours. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And so, you know, like you have good examples associated with them, but how do you evaluate whether or not you're doing a good job with any of these things? Yeah. Uh, it's very hard to fight the imposter. Uh, this, is, this is totally my perspective. I think like I would encourage anyone else to share their perspective as well. Uh, personally, it's very hard for me to fight the imposter syndrome. I feel like I'm just like this phony guy, just like taking my way through. Uh, but someone told me, someone, someone told me this like very important thing that actually uh, I think has a lot of value. I think you cannot cheat the cheat the market. Meaning, like you cannot cheat the product. You cannot cheat your user base. Meaning, if you build something that like users are actually using, and they say like, hey, I'm, I am, you know, I'm using this, and this makes sense to me. I think that is the that is the only signal that matters. Right. Uh, and uh, the problem with that, though, is there's a time delay between what you do and what uh, what actually manifests uh, in the results. Um, so I don't know if there's like a universal answer for this. Right. Does anyone else have an answer? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> uh, I think like experiments, maybe. I don't know. Maybe like, it's it's kind of hard to know if you're doing a good job. I don't know. I just tell myself I'm a reasonable PM, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I guess. <laughs> that's true. Uh, yeah, that's you can always wire up your features for analytics and then yeah. you can map back the features to whoever is the program manager, product manager for the engineering team. Which teams and which product managers are having the most impact on the product? Yeah. Um, I agree. So data is like part of the answer, but um, my experience has been that it's really hard to measure success on a purely metrics to metrics basis because like teams are working on different problems, different challenges, different opportunities. It's very hard to get away with saying like, you'll all have to drive revenue, I'll measure you by the revenue. It's a little bit like measuring product managers, like salespeople based on their commission rates is like much trickier to implement in reality. But I do agree with you on that general notion that like, you know, data is like part of the answer. You can determine if, uh, if a user is using certain features, and if that user who's using those certain features is either returning, yeah. disengaging, continuing on a growth path with the product, or in a disengagement pattern. Yeah, I think that's fair, right? Like, you know, figuring out, like, you know, are the retention numbers for this feature better overall? Are the adoption numbers for this feature better overall? Uh, totally valid answer. Uh, I just don't think that I've been at a place where this has been done. Uh, so, which hence maybe like my perspective is slightly different, but totally fair. Uh, I, can, uh, I can see how that works. Well, thank you guys for listening, and I'll see you next time.